this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker of today. And uh, he's right here. He'll be up shortly when I get out of the way. This is Gary Myers. And I think all these people know who he is because we've been here and seen him and uh, know all about him. So yeah. come on up. <laughs> That I'm Gary Myers, and uh, I uh, started off with an eight ball and three hookers. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good start. No, that's what I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lost my mind for a moment. Anyway, I came from Harrison, Arkansas, and uh, grew up as a cowboy on a restaurant horned Hereford ranch, or we called it the farm. And uh, in 19, well, before 1961, when I got my first guitar, my dad tried to teach me to play piano, but I didn't like reading music. I didn't, I couldn't stand this. I had to just, the guitar became my thing. And I took lessons uh, from Hugh Ashley and uh, Gus Smith. And uh, they got me on my way. And uh, I would like to introduce somebody who's here, and it's Gus Smith's nephew. And they together had a Guitar Smith's a music store, and it's still there. Gus is retired, but still playing great jazz guitar with his son on weekends all over Northwest Arkansas. You can catch him at Crystal Bridges and in around Fayetteville. Look for Gus and Matt Smith. And uh, I'm talking about Philip. He has the store down Harrison. Philip Smith. He's the lead guitar player for the Love and Spoonful. And stand up and take a bow, Phil. Let him know you're here. He's one of those brothers from another mother. And uh, that whole family has been so inspiring to me and, uh, and uh, the people in Harrison that backed me starting early on a week and I went on to be anything. And uh, there's also a gentleman there by the name of Jeff Corsi who saw me in the music store down there when I was taking lessons and he believed in me. And I was only playing guitar for maybe a year and a half at best. And uh, he encouraged me, in fact, drove 20 miles each way to come and get me and take me back down to the Buffalo River and get me in my first band. So he was really a lot of the reason that I got started playing in my first band. It was called The Coachman. And in those days, there was such a thing as instrumentals on the radio. There was The Ventures. And in particular, there was... Uh, What's his name? Uh, what Rock helped me out. He was. Uh, he had Memphis, the instrumental version. Ronnie. Lonnie Mack. Lonnie, Lonnie Mack. You guys know. He was the one. I, when I heard Lonnie Mack play later on, I found it was a flying V with a tremolo on it, Prototypes. And uh, wow, that sound just captured me. But the teacher said you got to start on the acoustic. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get my electric. And uh, finally got there, and uh, I got an airline guitar used to a kid down the street who didn't like it. And I took that to school and about the spring is really where I went to school, not Harrison, so the farm town school outside of Harrison. And my first performance on stage was Ahab the A-Rep solo through, <laughs> through a, a, a guitar that had no amplifier. And uh, what it did, it was, um, it won me, uh, I was the winner of the talent contest for the uh, FHA, the, the Ag Department, which means that when I was a freshman, winning the talent contest, I didn't have to suck a raw egg. <laughs> so we got down, had the meeting. I sucked one anyway. <laughs> well, once you get them started, they just go right down the road. <laughs> and then uh, the, the coachman went on through my high school years, and boy, was that fun. And back in those days, how did you get started? Well, uh, Jeff Corsi taught me uh, that you could go rent an armory and throw a dance, put up posters, charge a buck to get in, and they would come out. And boy, we were making money playing music. That was really a big deal in the 60s like that, and the Beatles had just hit. Everybody wanted to be one of the Beatles, you know, so I didn't follow the country music path anymore after that. It was down a different road. The British Invasion was a big a part of my and influences, and uh, I had a 
a 62 Fender Stratocaster and a 65 Fender Reverb and, and a turntable. I got that, and that was how, that was the tools of the trade. And boy, I wished I still had those. But it would be nice to. I still keep them. I wouldn't sell them. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and I met DB in the Shades. They came to the army and had a dance. Dean Billingsley. I met him and Harrison in the '60s, and. Uh, it's a good band, real good band. You know all the players in the band, John Chris Corn, and Huey Wapo. And I think it might have been Larry Lee on drums. I'm not sure. Do you be in the shades? It might be on drums. I'm not sure either. Um, it was Larry. Thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, anyway, so um, after the high school, uh, I went to Arkansas Tech. It's a good agriculture college. Dad said me to. I didn't want to go to college. All I wanted to do was play guitar. From day one, when I got my first $10 guitar, and uh, that's, that's all I ever wanted to do. I didn't really care about singing either. They just got in the way of my solos. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I love the guitar, and I always have, and probably always will. It's just been the focus of my life, and I don't regret it. It won't leave you. It's always there, and it's up to you, you know. It's just you and it, and... Uh, it's, uh, it's given me a life of music, and that's what I'm talking about here today. I went to college in 1968 at Arkansas Tech and didn't take any music courses. There were none of those springs. I never had a formal music lesson in college or any kind of schooling. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, it was the year that Sgt. Peppers came out, 66, 67, and that British Invasion was rolling, Spencer Davis and the Led Zeppelin, a whole lot of you know, and uh, it just that, that was where I was at. I wasn't in the books, and I wasn't making the grades. I didn't want to be there. I threw away a good college education because I did what I wanted to do. I'm an only child. I'm an only grandchild. Uh -oh. Spoiled. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is play guitar, and that's what I did. And uh, and I had a lot of support from my family. They did. Dad wanted me to take on keep the herd going. Uh, and uh, well, back to ending uh, high school uh, in 64, I showed cattle to Arkansas State Fair and met the Sons of the Pioneers. Roy Lillanum was the guitar player, an amazing guitar player. He had an orange Stratocaster with a tuning gear sticking out the end of the neck, a seventh string. And he had put it like a 12 string. He made an octave for the D string in the middle of the neck. Said it made his inside four chords sound better, and it did. And uh, he must have had a photographic memory because I came back a year later and when I saw him, he said, how you doing, Gary? So people like that were big influences to me. Great players. He was endorsed by Fender. He was in their publications. And also that same year, I went and saw Roy Clark in Arkansas State Fair. And boy, you want to talk about showmanship? He had it. Boy, he had that audience in his hand. And he wasn't the greatest guitar player I've ever heard, but he was really good at showing you how to have a good time with guitar. And that's a big lesson, especially if you want to make money playing guitar. And I wanted to make money playing guitar, as it turned out. Because, well, I, I went down to college at Arkansas Tech, and a year and a half, uh, they put me on probation. My grades weren't very good. So uh, uh, I got married, 1969, and uh, then I went back down there to uh, play in a band, and, and uh, it was called the Iron Cat. And this was when the day and age of horn bands were starting, and these were like rock and roll rhythm sections, blues rock, and horn players merging together like the Eyes of March vehicle, and blood, sweat, and tears. They were just knocked my head off. That first album was just so good still to me. And it put horns in my blood. And I love the sound. And I went on and uh, ended up going to Kansas City. And the Iron Cat didn't last long. Oh, I, got a, I had a Volkswagen van. Yeah. And it had daisy stickers on it, had love written across the back. And since the name of the iron, it was the Iron Cat, the face of it, and there's a picture over here in that book on the end, flip through, it, it looked like a cat. The headlines for the cat had a little mouth, and it was called the Cat Wagon. 
So I was a hippie. I was growing my hair long, and uh, I went to Kansas City because of Shorty Rogers. He was a bass player in my high school band, my best man in my first wedding, one of my best friends, and he was in Kansas City. Why don't you come on up here? And maybe we can play together. You'll find something up here. I did, just packed up, and <laughs> the Clampus moved to Hollywood. You know, <laughs> it's kind of what it was, because Kansas City was a different animal than being in Arkansas, and they did. <laughs> Thank you, bunch of people from Arkansas. <laughs> and the band that I happened to get in wasn't with Shorty at all. It was better. They were all conservatory musicians. And the horn section had just come off tour with James Brown. The drummer just finished the world tour with the Oscapades. And they had put together a band to be like a blood, sweat, and tears. The new thing, the horn band with the funky rhythm section. I learned funk. I learned jazz more than I'd ever known from these guys. I learned theory. I learned a lot. It was a schooling to play with Stoneface. That was the name of the band. And there's a picture down here in the book where you flip the pictures. Uh, such an amazing experience. Here I am, here I am out of Harrison, Arkansas, by way of Russell to college to Kansas City. They go to Chicago, their agent, for Stoneface, books a session to record a 45, two sides. We were in downtown Chicago, seventh floor on the lake, and it was January. Brother, it was cold. And we went, we went everything up seven floors, and Cadet Chess Studios. That was my first studio to ever go into, or even let alone play. And uh, <laughs> she, Ramsey Lewis was in Studio One, and the red light was on the whole time, couldn't go in, never even saw him in, but I know he was in there, that's, that's where he recorded, and he did. And while we were in session, uh, a gentleman been on Ed Sullivan so many times, famous one-liner, Kenny Youngman, <laughs> walks in the control room. This is my first experience in the studio. So that was one of my golden moments that I'll always remember, and that band as well. Well, it fell apart. We were coming back to Illinois in a school bus that had been altered over and uh, for bands, and blew up the motor. And we just gone and bought, and bought all these beautiful, shiny, flashy suits. We didn't have any money, so we just put up our suits at this place for them to rebuild the engine. And then we got back to Kansas City, and they said, well, we can't pay for this bus. They dumped the oil out of it and put it to the floor until it blew up. Oh. I was gone. I came back to Arkansas, went back to school again in Russell. And uh, that's when I met this guy named George Horn. He's from Eastern Arkansas, Wynn, Arkansas. And uh, well, I had been experienced quite a bit with the horn section and uh, Stoneface. I, I learned some new tricks there. And uh, so had George. And so George and I were, became buddies and we started a band called Junk. Now, you remember I said Jeff Corsi took me 20 miles each way to rehearse in, in the early 60s. Turns out that Jeff is in Russell this time. And he enters the band with us too. He's the keyboard player. So that was just quite a, quite a wild thing. And uh, we ended up going to Rockaway Beach to play the pavilion. If you remember the pavilion at Rockaway Beach, you know, it was great, I guess, before they had the Hells Angels thing, which wasn't nearly as bad as talking to but it hurt it. By the time we got there in 69, it was Washed Away Beach. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't happening so much. But we did. The, we did the summer season there, and um, our drummer left, and and we auditioned drummers. And there was this guy came in, and he played okay, and uh, he went over to the piano and played some real pretty original stuff. Soft, pretty. Ay, 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 ay. Larry Lee. It was Larry. <laughs> He said, no, we don't need that. <laughs> we got James Baldwin. They called him Fox back then yeah. on drums. And, and he didn't last but a few weeks. Because uh, really, what happened with that man is we met Mike Maples and John Gott. I guess they'd heard about the band in Springfield here. I don't know how, but they showed up at the pavilion. And that changed things for a long time for us. And uh, i tell you what, uh, Mike has just been one of those guys that's always been a great friend, and he's just a tremendous band leader organizer and uh, brilliant with the numbers and all that. 
He just, and he was a great B3 player. He wasn't fancy. He didn't do all that. He let me play a lot of solo. <laughs> and boy, and that was great, Mike. You, you, you've been such a you know, blessing to my life. And Karen, his wife. Oh man, we'll get to Joplin real quickly here. <laughs> you need to stay out of Joplin. <laughs> yeah, you need to stay out of Joplin. Yeah, okay, well, we're not going to do that quite. We're not going to go that deep, though. So, uh, anyway, when, um, let's see, where were we here? Rockway Beach. Oh, yeah, I went to uh, Springfield and uh, we formed a band. Some of the guys out of Jump, not Jeff, and uh, of course the drummer was gone. And there was a guy named John Middleton, myself, and George Horn that got with Mike Maples and John Gott and formed a band called Sacred Bow in 1970, or I believe it was, maybe late 69. Uh, no, it was 1970, it was. And uh, while we were getting this together, I got to play the S bar downtown for Raymond Rutledge uh, with some different guys. Was you in that? No, that, uh, George D was the bass player. And anyway, I got to play the S bar. You know, that was my first time playing in Springfield. And Springfield, by the way, was always the place I wanted to be. Growing up, back to the, I guess the 60s or the late 50s, I'm out on the West Coast uh, with my mom and dad on vacation watching the Ozark Jubilee on national TV. Springfield, Missouri, the promised land. And I couldn't wait to come to Springfield and play music because I knew this is the hot spot and this is where it was happening. And it was. You know, I couldn't get out of Arkansas fast enough. I, I, I mean, I, Arkansas, it is what it is. I love it down there, it's, but I wanted to play music for a living. You don't do that there. But back then, you could do it in Springfield. There was this thing as house, child, house bands. You folks know what I'm talking about. Six nights a week, nine to one. And uh, you worked when you played. And playing that much, you just like practicing a lot. You got better and better and better. And especially working with a unit, the band gets better and better and better. That six night a week, four hours a night thing made us better. You're never practice that much at home on your own. I wouldn't. I mean, some cats would, Pat Matheny would, but I, I wouldn't. Uh, and so, and uh, the house band jobs were great. We ended up with Zachary Bow after playing the Alibi here on Glenstone and maybe a few other spots. The warehouse. We played the warehouse here. We ended up, though, in Joplin at the Roman Palace. It was the hot nightclub in jo Joplin in that time period and became the house band for probably one and a half, two years. And not only was it nine to one, six nights a week, Friday and Saturday was a four to six jam session. Hmm. Okay, nobody there in jam to play, but people came in. Joplin had one heck of a music scene also, folks. Same time we were here doing this. They had great players there too, we found out. But we were the hot band from Springfield <laughs> walking in. And uh, the, um, uh, we met the, uh, yeah, well I guess he's the secretary, Eddie Bartholomew, the union. And they had one that worked for them because they had practice halls and jam sessions and it was cool. It wasn't just four chicken dinners a year. <laughs> Folks know what I mean, some of you. 150. And uh, so um, it was a great time in Joplin. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a crossroads. Well, I'm more than Springfield. It was a crossroads for all kinds of things. So um, it, it was fun. It was a great time. We'd come back and forth there and play over in Kansas. Um, Zachary. Kind of sum up Zachary. I could go on a long time about Zachary. Most of you know it. I got a lot of pictures down here on Zachary and the bands I played in in the 70s because Zachary didn't go through straight through for those eight years from 70 to 79, actually. I guess nine years. Um, there were some other things here that happened. Uh, it broke up. Uh, well, one of the things that happened, by the way, um, we had fire. Well, we didn't have a fire. Cunningham Metalworks had a fire. There was a new club in town called the Bijou. Coolest club this town's ever seen. It was really nice. And it was so forward and progressive, bringing in, uh, is it, it's Harvey Mandel, isn't it? Yeah, the guitar player. And uh, we booked in there, and War, the band, played, uh, I think, a night or two before us. It was still on the marquee. And Zachary Bow was there, I think, on a Friday, Saturday. I know there were two days in a row because we set up, played, 
and I had one heck of a setup. I took a Fender Showman and put it on the side, and I liked the black face Fender uh, 60s uh, amplifiers, and I had two Super Reverbs and a twin on top of that. That's two 15, 810s, and two 12s, or one, yeah, two 12s, and a Leslie, had to have a Leslie, that's an organ speaker. And uh, the, first, the only time I brought my vintage 1958 eight-string, four-pedal, sunburst, Gibson steel guitar in was on that night. Well, Mike called me Saturday morning after we finished our first <laughs> night. Saw them. What? Had fire. Nothing left. I have a 335 with me. Thank you very much. That's my Gibson guitar. And uh, M1 amplifier, 59 Pro. And it was came with the steel, but I didn't need it. I had a lot more amplifiers in there. So uh, he called me, and I went down and looked, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was the hottest fire you could ever imagine. Cunningham Metalworks had a, it was all double brick buildings, building walls, and the wall between was supposed to be a firewall, and it hadn't started. The fire started in Cunningham Metalworks, but across the wall, and got everything. The Bijou was gone too, and uh, it was a, it was a sad thing. It was a great night club, and. Uh, all of our equipment was gone. What are we going to do now? We had just incorporated the band. I still have my stock. <laughs> and, a picture. and it was it represented all of our equipment. It was a dollar amount put on our equipment, and you know we got stock to return. And but we were in the process of doing this and hadn't gotten insurance yet. This was just an ongoing thing. Oh well, we ended up with a lawsuit. And some of our best friends we ended up in court against, which we didn't want to do. And after two or three years of uh, litigation or uh, waiting to finally get our day in court with 12 jurors, um, they left. I was on the stand, and they said, uh, well, what did you lose in the fire? Cry baby, wah-wah. <laughs> A big muff. What? <laughs> Those are guitar pedals if you don't know and uh, it, it was all it seemed like a joke to them because they didn't understand exactly what we had or anything about our useful equipment and they had three big lawyers on the other side we had one guy from new york i think finally came in and it just we got no you get nothing so we did have a backer or two i had a lawyer and a uh, doc bauer uh, really helped the man a lot and uh, with their help, we got a $10,000 loan, re-equipped the band, went on, but now we've got payments. We've got to play top 40 dance music to make money. You know, we had been working on originals and doing the thing, working for a record deal. And so we did that, we ended up playing at Chuck Berry's Farm. There's some pictures down here of that. That was a lot of fun with the new equipment. And, uh, well, let's see where I'm, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Um, oh yeah. There was a concert at a place called the Landers. And uh, I headed up here for a minute ago, but the Granny's Bathwater, which we were all real good friends with Granny's. When I came to Springfield originally, Steve Smith, Ed Bungie, and his mother, his brother, Mike, and Don Ships were some of the first people I met and just, just you know, was really fascinated with what they were doing in the scene here. Steve has always been such a supporter of mine. These people that support you and give you help, they're golden. They're worth so much to you. You just can't put it in words because they keep you going when things are down. And uh, Tim Burroughs, there's just so many of them here in this room, and uh, Bill Jones, and uh, you know, it, it just thank you guys that are here and are out there watching this. It'll help me along the way. Throw that in right now. And Bob Green, yeah, he's not here, but we all used to go to the Village Inn. He is? Oh, you know, okay. Uh, uh, Bob, thank you for cashing our checks. <laughs> and feeding us breakfast after the gig. <laughs> He's been a great supporter of Zachary Bo and all of us in it on our own careers afterwards. Great friends. There's so many of you, I can't mention you all, but thank you all. You know who you are. And um, at one point, um, is that, uh, Benny Mahan was our lead singer now. Charlie McCall was the early lead singer from the get-go for a long, long time. And then Charlie fell out and we went through some changes. Mike, he went on his way. Uh, 
Well, I was at the land bridge. Yes, that's where I got to. But it did not like it. Well, anyway, Granny Vaswater was there, and Zachary Bow was there, and some little band called Family Tree. And uh, this was uh, later on to be quite a turning point for us because we thought we were the two hottest things going on in town, Granny's and Zachary. And there were some other good bands. Don't, I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm just trying to tell it the way it was. And uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> now Chris and the roadies had the tenth and the roadies hadn't started yet. It was uh, Shorty Dunn. Shorty Dunn. Yes, great band. There's a bunch of. This is a hotbed of great bands here. Thank you for reminding me, Chris. And, and you're one of the first people I met. I left you out. Thank you for all your support through the years. And Chris Albert back there, and he had a beautiful sister too. I remember him. <laughs> Everybody knew that. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Uh, we, uh, we had the issues fire, had the lawsuit, big buff, yeah, I got the loan, and went to the Landers. And uh, after we found out that Family Tree would turn out to be the Daredevils and get the record deal with A&M, mine quit. <laughs> Didn't you? Smart. <laughs> we weren't that good. We were good enough to go all over the Midwest and people loved us. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to tell too. When we played in Biloxi, no, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, we went downtown. I mean, downtown Birmingham. And uh, the way they did it was the bands were from 8 to 4 a.m. Two bands. Alternating sets. You work four sets like you did here, but you waited an hour to do the second, third, of course, the other band alternated. The other band was Jabbo Stokes and the Jive Rockets. And uh, <laughs> somebody you remember? Jabbo actually ended up playing for Roman Palace many years later. But and when we worked with him, he had a guitar play worthy by the name of Tommy Shaw. And uh, we, got, we stayed in the same quarters, uh, like a, a house that we all lived in there. Played opposite sets, one night one would start first and the other would start first, that way you get off of three instead of four. So, and uh, Tommy and I became good friends and he was quite a talent. Woo! What a player, personality, songwriter. You should do his impersonation of, uh, or see him do his impersonation of the ugliest man in the world. He had some funny things going on. And uh, so it's about a week later, we're in Kearney, Nebraska, at Clayton House, 10th and 0, downtown, and playing at a place called the Catmus Lounge, which is in the basement. And one of the guys that uh, had uh, Zager and Evans, one of those two, and uh, lived in the top floor, he came down and seen us. Uh, and Rocky uh, Hellwig came in and seen us. And uh, I think that's the first time I met Rocky. You might remember him, we had the Flaming Pit with the Bedell Parks, the, the real Trigo. That was the stuff. Jazz. Hmm. Looking money playing too. Okay. So I met him and then I'm going down the block from in Lincoln to this Hosp music. And it's a multi-story music store. I go up to the elevator and go in, and when the door opens, guess who walks out? No, I was in Birmingham the week before is Tommy Shaw. He was there too. So that was my chance meeting with Tommy Shaw. That was just something I had to throw in. I don't make you boring to you, but I thought it was cool. <laughs> and um while I was doing all the uh, six nights a week band, uh, jobs here in Springfield, the Alibi, I was also uh, at one point for about a year or two doing gospel sessions at Top Talent, which is uh, Wayne Carson Sai Simon's original place. So, and, but, but then it was uh, Russell Newport had it, and he was doing gospel in it. So I was borrowing, uh, I can't remember Lori's last name, what was Squeegee? Uh, oh, is it Hardy? Hardy, yes. Yeah. Well, Hardy's Martin with the high action because I needed acoustic for that. And it was wearing me out doing gospel. It's Winifred Swan. She was the, the, the head music teacher at BBC, Baptist Bible. And her charts were not that easy. She was a great player, Chopin. Woo. And uh, doing that most all day and then going in and playing rock and roll in the top 40, 9 to 1 on the electric at night. That electric seemed easier to play. Yeah. But boy, it was tough, tough work. I, I did a lot of albums during that, those years and sessions. And then um, Zachary kind of had a lull and a breakup or something because I got a call from Rocky Helwig, this great jazz organist, and um, to come and play with him in Texas. So I did. 
And that's the only time, I, at least the first time I know that I ever played jazz standards for a living. And we went to Corpus Christi, and uh, then over to um, Del Rio and, New L and Laredo. And uh, those were some really something. When we went to Del Rio, it was a country bar on the Mexican border. <laughs> and here's Rocky with his leopard skin covered Thomas. Oregon. And, uh, and Tassie, the sultry songstress, his daughter, who filled out the dress real nice. She sang these torch ballads and the nearness of you and, uh, you know, foggy day in a winter town. We did all that stuff. And I was just hanging on with these charts because Rocky liked to add a lot of chords. And kept me busy, and, 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 his, and his son, Guppy, Eric Amandus Helwig, we called him Guppy. He was my buddy, and we roomed together and had crab legs, lasting king crab legs every night. We got them all for half price. <laughs> Lived on the ninth floor, played on the tenth floor. There was a theater down below, and I noticed, oh, Gino Vanelli, I wonder who that is. And then a few nights later, I said, oh, look, Rush. Well, I know Rush, they're from St. Louis. <laughs> yeah. Different Rush. These guys are from Canada. They were the real Rush. But I was working all those hours. Couldn't go see them. But I'll look, you know, but I'll tell you that. Uh, and um, let's see. We got, I ran in at this Miss Book job to a keyboard player. And that, uh, oh, was he a player? He was also an all American, uh, all star. Texas athlete. He was ambidextrous, played left hand or right hand, anything on the stage. His name was Mike Reed. Anybody remember Mike? Boy, and good looking, did impersonation, sang, he could do it all. And I came back here and got together with Sammy Hammock, starting a band called Winners and Losers. And I, I called Mike and I said, hey Mike, we've got a gig up here for you. Can you come up? All the way from Del Rio, Texas. Here he comes in his black hearse pulling a U-Haul. <laughs> you know, you, you've heard the joke about it. you'll never see a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul. He did. <laughs> well, the blood B3s and cl clavinets, and he, he had all of it. And he was a great talent. And the Winners and Losers was a money-making band, and uh, we did top 40 dance music at the Alibi and Ramones. There's pictures over here. And uh, so, Getting Zachary back together after that. Oh, I know Sammy went uh, with uh, Benny to down below the bowling alley there. That that when that opened up. <laughs> Amador. Amador, yeah. And when we lost Sammy, he was our front man. He was out front and everything, lead singer and everything. It wasn't the same, and so we tried to keep it together and uh, ended up uh, calling it Zachary Bo again. But it wasn't. There's a lot of things we called Zachary Bo after Mike left. It really wasn't. Once Mike left, it was never the same. Actually. Uh, there was a there was a there was a decent version of it of a Kenny Wendell Kenny Wendell uh, from the ranch over in Kansas, and uh, that was uh, we recorded and played some big jobs and played at his club and uh, that was a good band. It was a totally different take. It was more of a blues rock band, but many different versions of Zachary Bo, a lot of different players all through the seventies and different bands in between, like Rocky Helwig playing jazz. Wow, I did that. Okay. And then uh, got to not get into 1979, disco was coming on. Mm. Well, they put a uh, DJ in the floor in front of the stage. Uh oh. Sorry. You didn't hear it, but it's in my ears. These are Bluetooth hearing aids. I'll let that go next. Anyway. <laughs> Playing all that rock and roll music will have its toe on your ears, let me tell you. And so, uh, sorry about that. My bad. I forgot to turn the Bluetooth off. And uh, Sammy Hammock, we played Alibi and Ramones. We were ending up the last version of Zachary Bow, which after George finally left, I didn't even want to call that, I called it Zebo. And that just lasted a little while. I was approached by Randy Chowning. No, Rusty. Chowney, Randy's brother. And he had married a girl named Tony Trafone, good singer. Got her a deal with a &M Records, like he had been a part of with the Daredevils, I guess. Yeah, I think he was an early management of the family tree, or Daredevils. But he was definitely uh, Randy's brother. 
And so he came along and he got great players together. I'd still feel Larry Van Fleet, Steve Blue. Uh, it was a powerful band. And uh, we went to Mississippi Nights and played for Steve over there. And uh, it just fell apart real quick. There wasn't any jobs, no money. And disco was hitting hard. The nightclub jobs were not what they used to be, six nights a week and everything. I decided to go country. I don't know if I decided to. It decided for me. <laughs> I had a call from my old friend, Mike Reed. He was playing down at Helen Holler Lounge in Branson. Country gig. Had a bass player that knew every country song in the world. And all the rock and roll, blues, jazz, guitar player needed to know his what key. I couldn't play them like the record like we always did before. This was just go for it. And this started me as getting recognized a little bit as a country guitar player, especially in Branson. And um, so, let me go to page two. Paul Harvey. I got a call from uh, one of my former employers. There was Merle and Donna Ellison that owned the townhouse and the alibi. And uh, I never knew Merle much, but Donna was always my contact. She was so nice. When I was down there at the Hill and Harder Lounge, um, she called me and asked me to put together a band at the townhouse with Jolene, great country singer, and she'd do all kinds. And so I did, and I took it in there, and I was the first person to bring in a band with a black man in the townhouse, Don Ships. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I'm proud of that, but nothing wrong with it till the last night he skipped his bar tab. <laughs> <laughs> you know Don? About <laughs> uh, that time also, when we were playing there with Jolene, and we called the band Falcon at that time, David Evans was in there, and Don Chips, Steve Blue, myself, and Jolene. Uh, I started writing a little bit. We went out to Steve Smith's studio, Mau Mau Studios, and uh, Nixon there and recorded some of my stuff. And then this guy named Tom Becker, who used to be in Granny's Bathwater, had put together a band called Entropy. And it was jazz. And I'm on that album for a few cuts, and I recorded that there at Steve's Mau Mau Studios. And then I went on, I was going back every night and doing the townhouse. But Merle Allison, the owner of the townhouse, got cancer and knew he was going to die. And Keith McCormick, Keith McCormick, you know who he is? Yeah. You know, famous songwriter, Shuggy Shad, and owed him money. He owed Merle money. And we were packing the place with our band, Falcon, Jolene, and, and he fired us. He wanted to work the money out of Keith before he died. So we got put out. Went, wow, we we're just packing the place. Well, my wife at the time got wind of a new club coming on called South Fork. And it would be a copy of Mickey Gillies. If I actually call it Gillies, down Pasadena. The bucket machine, the punching ball, that era was coming on. I had a friend that I grew up with named Bobby House. He wrote the song, Could I Have This Dance by Ann Murray. He was in Nashville and I went down there and he told me, well, there's this new album out and I got a song on it by Ann Murray called Urban Cowboy. And I thought, he said, it's already gone platinum for it's been released. Really? Way to go, Bobby. Good for you. You know, homie boy here from some hometown, knew each other. He was the first one I took and showed my 62 strap to. <laughs> and uh, here he is in Nashville, the Peer International Nashville Division, uh, as a writer. And I uh, heard about this urban cowboy thing. So this club was coming up here in town called South Fork, a spinoff of Gillies, the urban cowboy. That's where the movie was made at Gillies in Pasadena, 1980, John Travolta. A big movie followed the Saturday Night Fever. And this is when I started hearing about Mickey Gilly. I really didn't know who Mickey Gilly was before that much. And um, let's see. I had a, a radio show. Don Paul got me a radio show. Gary Myers, live at South Fork. Gary Myers Band, group, GMG. Uh, and uh, Jolene, and I, I had that going on. I put 10 years into nightclub work and around the area up here, mainly bars. And uh, so we got this thing going big time. They were lined up outside on weekends to get in. They had to let somebody up or somebody else would come in capacity. And it was working great. Um, I ended up at the Ozark Country Jubilee for seven years. And I got pictures down here. 
and uh, went to a lot of musicians. It seemed like all these bands that I've been to where I was the last one. Everybody else come and going. I was still standing there around all these different people. Well, now this band had a nucleus that was together seven years. The picture from the far right up here. We won Band of the Year two years in a row. The only two years they had the category of Band of the Year, 1986-1987, at the OMAs, the Ozark Music Awards, and hosted different years by Ralph Emery or Janet Daly, Connie Stevens, it, and it was the Presley's. And they had red carpet with the lights and the cameras were flashing, pull you in in the limo. They were really doing it upright. Big deal. We won Band of the Year two years in a row. And that was just <gasps> up against Presley's, Ball Novers. Oh, and by the way, Country Music World. There's a band called Nightway, and the bass player was George Horn. <laughs> I beat George. <laughs> oh, well. And so. There you go. And then that would go on till uh, the end of 1989. We'd gone through different owners, and uh, Warren Stokes had gone on down to Eureka Springs, and the Campbells from Mozart down here took over. And um, at the end of 89, three of us got fired because we knew more about what we were doing than they did. That's my opinion. And it's not a really good idea. When new owners come in, it's a pretty good idea to clean the house and start with your people. They're going to take the orders from you, and you know more than they do. This happened to be the best thing in the world happened to me. I was immediately offered a job from Warren and Eureka for more money. And uh, I went down there, and I moved in the basement with two other guys named Clay Cooper and Joey Riley. And I don't know if you know who they are or not, but Clay Cooper has his own theater in Branson now. I met him in the Gold Miners. I coached that band too through these award sessions, and they won awards. Um, and then, of course, Joey Riley. Wow. I met Joey then, and uh, then I got an offer. As soon as we taken the group pictures for that season, I was the one this time that quit. <laughs> and I had an offer from Larry Vance. He was married to Jim Thomas's daughter. He owned uh, the Roy Clark Theater, you would know it as. And uh, asked me if I would put the band together in Branson for the new Mickey Gilly Theater. Uh, really? He said, yeah, I want you to band to be the house band, play there all the time, and the second act will revolve around. Mickey will be one of them, but they'll be the Forster Sisters, Diamond Rio, Mo Bandy, all these different country groups. Everybody knows that. It was a bunch of good things. And so, uh, let me think about it. Yeah. You know, I was, and we just taking the pictures, and I had to tell Warren Doris, I'm going, bye bye. And they were real good. They supported me, and they were behind me all the way. It was great. And then I did the opening night for the Buck Trent show at Mickey Gilly's family keyword theater because it was still on with Jim Thomas then. Now, Jim Thomas was the guy who owned what you'd know as the Roy Clark Theater in the Lodge of the Ozarks, and uh, he was the one that got Roy Clark to come in and play for a while with his name on it. He was compensated and then sold it to him, to Roy. Well, here he is next door. It was Hee Haw. It was Country Music World. And now it's going to be Mickey Gilly Family Theater. I'm back where I started in Branson. And uh, during that year, Jim Thomas did the same thing to Mickey Gilly. He did to Roy Clark. He sold it to him. So that was the only year it was the family theater. After that, it was just the Mickey Gilly Theater from starting in 1982. And no, I'm the wrong decade. It was 1991. 1990 was my first year as opening night for Gilly. And at the end of that year with the Buck Trent show, since Gilly had bought it in the middle of that part of the year, or in the middle of the year, um, he didn't want an opening night. Well, I went to see, had a meeting with Gilly at his house. And I thought I was going over there to ask to use his bus for some Buck, Tro, Buck Trent road shows. And he said, I'm not bringing Buck back next year. And I said, oh, you're not? I said, no, no. I said he said, he says, do you want a job? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I learned a very important lesson about negotiating that time. Well, how much do you want? Oh, I'm making $80 a show. With, Look, Trent, that's fine. You know, I'm just happy to have a job. You're, you're cutting everybody else loose except me. Thank you. Well, I know the others are making two and a quarter. <laughs> the thing to say when that happens, folks, is 
the going rate. That's what I want. <laughs> Well, it all worked out in about a year. When I joined the group, uh, there was no bumps for me on the bus. He was still doing road work and, uh, and has off and on between uh, Branson. I slept on the floor. And coming off all this stuff with Branson and the band of the year and da 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 da, all that I've, I've said, going to a rhythm guitar player, not a lady, and sleeping on the floor. But I'm getting paid and I'm working. So, okay. Uh, we go on to this, and uh, it went into bed. I see, 1993, uh, there was a fire. Well, Gillies had already burned down in Pasadena, 1990, when I first joined with him. And uh, they had a litigation for two years over that, and as soon as he wanted it, it burned down. Sure, what fire was his partner who got that fight over that. That's a whole different story. He was like the mafia of Pasadena. You shouldn't do things to him. <laughs> Tell you some stories about that I've heard, but that'd be a whole different thing. Um, so uh, we had the fire again. Gilly had a fire this time. Conway Twitty was booked in there to share the dates with Mickey Gilly that year of '93. And uh, Conway happened to be the one that was set up on the stage. We'd come in off the road. Our gear was in the bus, safe outside. Conway lost everything. And then about three months later, he lost his life. He died. So I guess Conway just wasn't meant to be for that year. Gilly could have hung it up a long time ago. And uh, but he was so tenacious and just wants to play and entertain so much. And he's the most amazing guy, one of the most amazing guys I've ever met. He just don't give up. He just keeps on going. I, I go out, I'm a little bit of an announcer MC for the show. And one of the things I always say is he's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps on going. And he does. He just, and he's an amazing guy. He takes care of the band like family. Because it really it is, it's his family on the road, and that's where he wants to be, or in Branson. Yeah, and so uh, we got a good run out of Branson, really good. Uh, um, Rocky Stone was the lead guitar player when I joined, great player. He's got a song on Chet Atkins' album. Uh, he was from Rhode Island, different cat for being a country guitar player. and. Uh, even my best buddy, we roomed together for a while. We lost him to stroke. Then I got to be the lead player. I was just sitting in the wings. Uh, Gilly had told me to be ready because I thought he was going to fire him, but I didn't know he was going to have a stroke. And all that's kind of real weird. It's uh, bittersweet. Your friend dies, but you get his job. So I took it. Somebody else would have, I didn't. So um, and, uh, this went on. And in 1995, Oh, first we came back in 94 but with a new theater and a horn section and a guy named Joey Roddy, which I had met in Eureka, and told Gilly, you need him here. You need to go see this guy. What do I got? Five minutes? Okay, thank you, Chris. I've got it. You, yep, 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 okay. I didn't know if I'd be able to talk long enough. Imagine that. Just a moment. Well, you said you wanted to get to your show, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I gotta be out the door at 1.30. I gotta be there at 2.15, 2.30 at the very latest. Okay, um, in 95, we started a band called the Horn Dogs. Yeah. And back to my Horn Dog days. And I wanna thank um, Gary and, and uh, Barbara. 417 Magazine for being here. They've been supporters of the Horn Dogs all along. Great ones. We appreciate you being here. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, this band was a sideline band that made its own rules in the beginning. We were going to take you back to the day of blood, sweat, and tears, and Eyes of March, and Chicago, and uh, some funky music. And um, we had a big time, and it became a big hit. We created our own thing. We only played from 11 to 1 a.m. at night on one night a week. It was originally two nights. Well, we'll get to the one night a week, Chris, I'm hurt. And uh, it, was, it was a big success, and it was a lot of fun. Man, it, it, was, it, it, it had its times. It was a great band. But it could only work in Branson at 11 o'clock because everybody was in shows. I got a lot of jobs, all kinds of jobs. I had to turn down. We can't go to Kansas City, can't go down here to Biloxi, or anywhere, you know. So it was limited, it was a fun band, and uh, it's kind of a, 
just a uh, reunion band now, but I love the horns. And uh, it started off with Mickey Gillies' horn section, Kevin Bashir's on bass, which I played with Kevin in Mickey Gillies' show now for 27 years. Some of you might know Kevin. Mm -hmm. And he's been my brother in arms and the Mickey Gillies show. We actually talked together, it sounds great, before that, you know, music lessons, and I didn't even get into that whole part, but we gotta keep moving here. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a, a bunch of guys from Gillies that rehearsed in the bottom, uh, under the stage in the basement for this band we're putting together, Need a Lead Singer, and this guy named Bucky Hurd walks in. He said, look, here you're looking for a singer. We found one. <laughs> Amazing, powerhouse, fabulous singer. And he's currently, well, let me tell you what he did. He was 50s the hop, then he went to Legends, and he was uh, uh, Jake Blues of the Blues Brothers for many years there as his main job, and uh, vocal teacher on sideline. He got an offer from Bill Medley, the real righteous brother, to put the duo back together, and he wanted him to be Bobby Hatfield. And right now, Bucky Hurd is the Bobby Hatfield at Harris in Vegas. So that's, he's, he's not good. And he deserves every bit of it. But I miss him. We can't get back together and play again. I've gone out and seen him a couple times. They're going to be at Buffalo Run coming up here, I think it's June 15th on Thursday. I'm going to be there. And I've seen him twice. I went out the last couple of years, and they were amazing, really good. Uh, now let's see, getting past the horn dogs there. They went on for... A long, long, long time. We had a lot, a lot of good times with them. And uh, this job come along the uh, presidential inauguration ball. And I can't remember which Bush it was, but they had a Branson version. It was the ones in 2005. And uh, I was contacted uh, because I guess maybe I'd been, I'd been doing the Gene Williams country music TV show. I was the MD and band leader for that. And so this guy called me and asked me to put, put together a band for the inauguration, Branson style. It's in Branson, but would be connected through satellite to Washington. And it was a big deal, supposed to be a big deal. And I hired a big band. I had a four-piece horn section. Got Ned the band, uh, Wilkerson, is it Wilkerson or Wilkerson? Ned the band to, to do the, uh, arrange the horns for me. And then I had steel, fiddle, and acoustic. Had the countryside over here and had the big band over there. Had to cover everything. And uh, it was quite a job. It's the only time I have ever, and I don't know about anybody else, in Branson, Missouri, as a local, booked a job for $10,000. And I did it. <laughs> Paid most of it out. But I, I, I like to pay the players. Uh, anyway, uh, the Chateau was so impressed with me, they asked me to do their New Year's. And I did their New Year's for four New Year's in a row. And nobody had ever done it twice, even before I did four. So I'm proud of that. And uh, I, was, I was also starting to work with Joey Riley on his own show. And he's in Gillies. And Joey, was, his, his shtick with, with Gilly was like the Martin Lewis of Branson. Uh, he was the, a musician in the band that was coming out and making fun of a legendary star. And it turned heads and made people laugh so hard they were crying. And I mean, all through the 90s, we were ripping it. They had that thing packed. It was amazing, the crowds we had. And Joey and Mickey's comedy together could go on. They'd have lived. And on and on and on and on. And we're sitting there in the band. But it worked. It worked. And it was really good. But finally, Joey would leave the show. Oh, Gilly had an accident in 09, among other things that just about killed him. He lived through. But in 2009, he had the big one. He fell backwards off the porch helping somebody move a couch and uh, landed on his back, rolled over on his head down an embankment. It had hyperextended his back, and they brought him up here and put him in the emergency room in uh, Cox and uh, ended up putting titanium in his back to make him work much better. <laughs> okay, and uh, anyway, he's amazing. In less than a year, he came back and was on stage singing. He's been working ever since. We're touring all over the country. We've toured Canada. We've toured all over. And Mickey Gilly's job has been wonderful. I can't say enough about the man and the band that I work with. It's been a good gig, and it's been a good life. I've, um, I've done 55 years playing guitar, 47 years professionally, 36 years of shows in Branson, and the last 27 with Mickey Gilly. And I'm not done. I've got a 3 o'clock show to make.